Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have ongoing conversations about living in the future. My guest today is Isham Oduri, the CEO and co-founder of Enigma. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to talk to you about uh, the power of big data, the limits of consumer privacy, and the future of our data-driven world. Uh, Hisham, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, if you've got questions, you can ask them in the comments section below if you're watching live. If you're listening to this later on as a podcast on Apple Podcasts or in Google Play, do, you can leave questions and comments, but we will not be able to get back to you in real time because that's not how the internet works. Um, but if you do have questions, leave them in the comments section. Um, Enigma is, a, is an operational data management and intelligence company. Um, I think most people may know of you guys from Enigma Public, Yes. Uh, your public data sets. Yes. Why don't you explain to me a little bit about what um, being an open data company means today. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we started out just collecting a massive amount of public data anywhere we could find it, with the mission really being to try to connect very disparate facts about the world. And we realized in the process that, you know, just as much as access to this underlying data was broken, uh, this pattern was, you know, reverberating uh, for people's own data, for uh, kind of public-private data reporting schemes, like in regulatory environments, and, and really what we brought was this notion of open data as an operational model uh, everywhere we went. And our sweet spot today is, you know, one cultivating this 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 massive, you know, uh, asset and repository of public data, and bringing it to bear in actual you know, problem environments often behind the firewall for, for, for enterprises. So though we collect and, and, and distribute a tremendous amount of data, we found that taking the next step forward of actually interpreting uh, that data and linking it to, to private data uh, really helps scale the impact of some of the problems we want to solve. So can you explain, I mean, people hear about this open data sets, public data sets, private data sets. Yep. What kind of data sets are we talking about here? So we're talking about source data, official data, things that government agencies would publish, things that you know, uh, international uh, agencies would publish. Everything is disparate from corporate registration records and, and property assessments to H-1B visas or cargo container shipments. Uh, definitely not talking about things like you know, LinkedIn data, which has been a, a, a huge topic of debate recently as to whether or not that's even a public data set. Right? Mm -hmm. There's that lawsuit. Uh, 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 with much contention recently, but we're talking mostly about official source data where there's been a mandate and and you know uh, uh, a kind of formal legal approval to put this out into the public domain, uh, mostly for increasing transparency in you know the the economic and, and trade system. Right? It's very important for us to know, you know, for instance, from an accountability standpoint, what our government spends with the uh, various private companies or from an accountability standpoint, you know wh what the distribution of visas is going to amongst companies. Um, so, so that data is collected often by the government for alternative purposes, like reporting, planning, uh, resource allocation, and then given back to the public for this uh, you know, secondary and often tertiary benefit. The most popular example being just weather data, right? All of mm -hmm. the weather data that we collect comes from uh, official sources, or GPS mm -hmm. uh, as a technology. So you take all those public uh, data sets, and then you can merge them with private data sets that a company will give you specifically, and m really see the insights between combining the two. Yes, very often. So think about you know a, a canonical use case where you're you're trying to do something like uh, you know figure out if a company is even real, right? If it's a small company, take say like a a, a restaurant or a small business. Very often, the the sort of profile that you would have on them is extremely thin. But if you were to look at things like their liquor licenses, or or, or even you know uh, Department of Labor inspections or health record inspections, you get a much more granular picture of who they are, uh, and often that helps these companies kind of instantiate that they're even real for getting their you know uh, access to credit for getting you know uh, insured right these sort of things kind of moving from the here's your 18 page application in a very annoying process through seven different compliance tests something that can happen online in an automated way and in a less risk-worthy way in general. Yeah, so instead of just typing them into Google, seeing if they have a website, that means they're real. Yes. You can have all these other data sets validate uh, for even basic stuff. Absolutely. 
Yeah. The, uh, we were talking before we went live about Ozarks, how it's your favorite show, my new favorite show. Yes. Um, and the idea of um, using these data sets for compliance and for financial reporting and even to hunt down money launderers. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, one of the best shows out there. Huge plug to Netflix has become first in class Hollywood studio. Mm -hmm. um, they paid for it. Yes. <laughs> they yes. bought their way into that market. They certainly have. Um, but the, the show is about you know this Jason Bateman character who is... Um, I'm not going to tell you too much because I know you didn't. Yeah, I'm, not as, I'm, I'm not as far as you are. But he's um, uh, basically uh, 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 finds himself as a money launderer to this uh, drug cartel, and he has to go. The catch is that he kind of saves his life by by saying that he's going to go to the Ozarks and uh, you know uh, uh, find new channels to launder money through, and he starts you know buying into these sleepier businesses and then passing through a variety of costs, right? And so the, the money laundering problem is a, a, a huge theoretical problem in that, honestly, you're, you're looking at patterns of activity uh, amongst uh, uh, different you know, merchants or, or consumers of, of financial services and also the connections in between them, right? So you have like a registered agent, obviously, like someone like uh, Jason Bateman who's going around and doing this you know, for a couple of businesses, and he's buying in privately to them and, and, and starting to get his name on uh, a, a variety of different forms. And you'll notice that, you know, pattern of activity. And this is something that banks have to fight against, uh, uh, obviously because it, it's a detriment to, to the system, and, the, you know, they're on the hook for, for doing this. And with the decentralization of crime, right, crime is, you know, gone just as digital and decentralized as music has, you know, this is a much bigger problem, right? There's no one big mob family that the government can be lurking around for, you know, months and, and, and getting, getting them uh, Capone style. This is a, you know, all out, you know, a chase on, on many fronts. And so we've helped and, and worked a lot kind of bringing public data to bear on that problem, but also bringing our technology that we've used to aggregate all of this public data to bear on that problem. Just because banks have, a lot of technological uplift to do to merge their own data sets into you know powerful contextual clues for these investigators that they have on staff. I feel like we've, we're at that point now where we've got all this public data created by government agencies, we've got all these private data sets, every company has multiple data sets and many different formats often within the same company, yet there's, there's not a lot of standardization. Making them work together is actually a major challenge. It's a huge challenge, and, and probably one of the biggest theses that we have at Enigma is that there's a big divide in between, you know, one of my investors called it this way, it was like the, there's a world where data is instrumented in bits, and there's a world where it's instrumented in atoms. So take, say, uh, the tech companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, I mean, they've all done an amazing job taking the data that they get from your activity browsing the web and creating these new services like search and better e-commerce experiences. But that data all exists, it's like digitally native, right? It, it's just listening to you on the web. The web is in fact a protocol. And those protocols were designed to speak to each other. But when you have this, this data that is instrumented in atoms or the real world, like someone going into a bank in you know, the Ozarks and asking for a small loan, Right? That looks different than someone else walking into a different bank, bank branch or you know, a cargo container ship coming in that's asking for the name of the company that's uh, uh, doing the shipping. All of this data was designed, uh, not at all designed to speak to each other. So there's a huge kind of stitching problem of this data together, which you know, I think it will take these more uh, kind of less purely tech industries longer time to reap the benefits of what you've seen in tech with big data. But when they do, I think it'll change uh, a lot of how we live day to day in a pretty impactful way. I also get the sense that uh, when there's a financial motive to stitching together these data sets and, and creating these insights, businesses find a way to pay for it and they find a way to get it done. Credit card companies are one of the first uh, companies to be able to identify patterns and identify yep. fraud. Um, I feel like the public sector is pretty far behind when it comes to creating insights from these massive amounts of data. Um, is that a fair assessment? Well, listen, you know, the, the private sector has always, in some senses, had an edge in operationalizing technology. Yeah, the financial incentive is huge, and also the, the kind of operating style of a smaller unit. Right? The US government is 
just factually one of the biggest organizations in the world and getting anything done is really a people problem when it comes to it at the end of the day. Making sure incentives are aligned, making sure you know, uh, people are taking the right amount of risk. Um, but we've seen the government do some very innovative things. And you know, if you take, say, you know, small examples, so I'll give you a for instance. We collaborated with the city of New Orleans, I think it was like two years ago, to help them uh, basically predict uh, uh, where the slum landlords were, uh, mostly to install smoke detectors in these homes. So post-Katrina, you had this huge amount of blight. And a lot of landlords were getting away, leaving people with bad conditions. And you know, honestly, uh, uh, smoke detectors do just a great job of preventing death from fire. Mm -hmm. And so instead of sending uh, firemen to random home, what if you use factors like you know, demographics and the, how old the building was and you know, the last time that there was a certain kind of installation of some sort of uh, you know, infrastructure like telecommunication infrastructure. So you use all of these factors and you get like a hit rate of the doors that you're knocking on that's substantially higher. So we've seen a lot of this kind of money ball for local government stuff uh, play out pretty strongly. Um, obviously, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of data usage in the intelligence community, as you can imagine. Um, so we do find that there are pockets of, of innovation. Again, though, it's all about how you operationalize it. And also, I mean, I, I think that skill set, so you have all those data points, but then you have to query it in the appropriate way, look for the patterns. You almost have to search for the correlations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole series of, uh, of questions and answers, and it, it's establishing a relationship with the data that I, I think we're just starting to figure out how yeah. that works. Uh, totally. A, we're starting to figure out how it works from a skill set perspective. And B, there's like a mind shift in terms of you know, statistical thinking versus not statistical thinking. So, you know, there's the saying, I forget who says it, and I feel really bad because we're on camera. Um, but it's like... You can all, add it to the notes we'll later. We'll add it to the notes later. It's, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful, mm. right? And so it's really about whether you can, you know, without the data, without the algorithms, contextualize a little bit the parameters of your statistical thinking. So I may not get this right, like in the case of the fire, you know, we may not get this right, but we may increase our chances of getting it right, or we may reduce our surface area of, of risk or what we have to search for. So that, bringing that kind of get it done attitude to the problem, that's skill set number one when it comes to being able to think statistically. Some folks are locked into, well, you know, the only way we can be sure is if we have X, Y, and Z. I'll give you a case in a private example. You know, uh, very often in banks, for, for reasons of historical fraud and compliance, the way they would verify whether someone was real before they issued a credit card was their telephone, making sure their telephone number and their address matched, you know, uh, whatever they had on the application. You know, not all companies use actual telephone landlines now. Not all you know, companies use their, their main address as the one they're actually operating out. There's some kind of outmoded realities of you know, people working at WeWorks now and people mm -hmm. using voice over IP and you know, getting comfortable with identifying folks through you know, their, their social presence or through some of the data sets that uh, we bring in at Enigma that provide these ancillary proof points. That's really like a comfort and process thing at the end of the day and looking and running historically the, the, the statistics to see whether the likelihood of it being real is, is strong versus the guarantee that you would get from these alternative means beforehand. I think that's an interesting point too, that, that, that assumption that all models will be wrong. Yes. Either largely wrong or you know, yeah. um, wrong in a, in, a more, um, in a smaller way, but that's okay because can it can still help you make good decisions. Um, is that a skill that we're doing a good job of teaching our children and, and, and where would they even get that training? I mean, I, I, it wouldn't be in math necessarily. It wouldn't be in social studies. Like, where do they get that sensibility? So I, I feel like the stats has often been subclassed in uh, like math education in, in general. Um, but you see it in other places. You see it popping up even in like your ESPN feed these days, right? People are being much more comfortable with prediction being part of their lives. 
And honestly, I love these black swan moments events where all of that flies in our face, right? So take, say, the last election, you had Hillary kind of winning, and you had the world's best data scientists at some of the finest you know, institutions call it wrong. Yeah, it, winning, but winning was not having a 70% likelihood to win. Yes. Because that still means that one out of three times, Donald it, Trump wins, and guess what? This was one of those three times. Absolutely. And then there's, you know, the, uh, there's the education that we're seeing these patterns get people more comfortable. I mean, in the classrooms, you know, I think it, it, uh, one of the biggest problems that, that we have is just the applied learnings. Like, I have no idea why don't, they don't teach personal finance in a mm -hmm. classroom. I mean, I was an idiot with my money at the age of 18 and, mm -hmm. you know, the effect on debt and all of that. Like, you know, I'm still amazed that they don't, they don't do that. Um, so I feel like we're moving in a world where education will get more and more about, like, the applied stuff, less about the theoretical stuff. But then I worry if, you know, we're losing some parts of, of cultural learning. You know, it's all a trade-off. I'll go even further down that road and sure. talk about artificial intelligence. Sure. Um, artificial intelligence, hugely uh, transformational technology. It seems to me that there's a role for artificial intelligence in helping us make sense of these of this world of uh, overabundance of data yep. and find those patterns for us. Are you optimistic about uh, AI helping us make sense of that, or is that going to be something totally separate from the rest of our human experience? No, I mean, I'm optimistic to the sense in which I'm optimistic about humanity in general. And I feel like that's a flip gene thing that happens to, to folks at some period in time. I mean, I think one, one of the things that I like the most about the promise of artificial intelligence is that it'll actually help the technology go away, right? Because right now, the focus is on, uh, uh, on technology but, uh, and data, right, being so present. But, but in reality, that the, the work of data is very intensive. There's a reason they call it data mining when mm -hmm. you're looking for stuff in a data set. It's very nasty. The data sets aren't clean. Uh, it, it's kind of brutish in a sense. And so what I like about AI is that it creates these, these feedback loops from observed experience. So though you're collecting all of this data from all of these places, you don't really necessarily know how it will come together, so you start to study the outcomes. And machine learning helps us you know, really you know, be a bit more outcome-oriented in how we get to statistical thinking. And so I think it'll help us kind of abstract away some of the nastiness of, of that work and, and be a bit more outcome-oriented in, in how we approach it. Now, it's definitely going to be scary in terms of the impact on automation and some areas where, frankly, I think AI should be, you know, left alone, like, you know, uh, uh, replacing a jury, mm. right? Like, do, do, will we ever get that emotional intelligence quality? I don't know. Um, but and, another, and, and you'd have to choose and say, I, you want that emotional quality in the jury, yes, as opposed to a pure likelihood that this person is guilty or not guilty. Yes. Um, and so for me, that, that like humanity, like that underlying humanity, I think is, is uh, super important. And frankly, just like being in the business and seeing how much the human touch is important to even convincing people to start thinking statistically, I'm optimistic that we won't lose that you know, with the advent of, of AI at scale. So you t uh, we talked a little bit about we touched a little bit about whether LinkedIn was a public data set. Yeah. A lot of people when they, they they sort of sense that they're living in this world where everything that they know about everything about them is available online, from their purchase patterns to their age to their medical history. Um, it makes people uncomfortable. It makes people worry that the government has too much information. I'm personally more worried that private companies have too much information and they're far less regulated. Yes. Um, is that something? Do we do we need laws to protect our personal information? Does that is personal information should be treated separately than, you know, your your government records? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. So we have, you know, very little protection as to the laws that that govern the way in which we kind of give our data away, right? So think about it in certain professions. In the medical profession, it's on lockdown, right? But for some reason, it's not necessarily on lockdown in, in, in other industries. And the reason was, you know, back then, there wasn't much you could do with your personal information. Today, they have a really good sense of how to get you to convert or the likelihood that you'll be somewhere. Or, and so, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's actually mostly beneficial to us, in my opinion, mm -hmm. right? Um, but at the same time, 
our data still deserves that amount of, uh, uh, of kind of sanctity in, in how it's handled, right? Uh, Europe has been coming out with very strong laws. There's a law coming out called uh, uh, GDPR. Um, it's set to be enacted in, in 2018, and it carries everything from you know, uh, making sure companies are tracking the lineage of their data, personal data, who has it, how is access giving it, given, given to it, you know, within the company, uh, right to be forgotten measures. When you say delete my data, are you actually deleting it? Are you keeping it for uh, some other piece of information? So, you know, there's an exchange always in between consumers and the, the services that they work for. A lot of these services are free and we love them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I would never, I would, give away part of myself for YouTube access, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just very happy about and, it. And probably you have. And probably <laughs> I have, yeah. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that that part that I give away shouldn't be put into a safe box, and that I know that that box is like under a bunker and, you know, all of those you good know, things. Also, the idea of expiration of data, yes. which in this world, in, in the digital world today, is, is a relatively new concept. It used to be that there was a certain obscurity. If something happened 30 years ago, it would be, it would be difficult to find records and get, get a profile from back then. But there are kids today who've been online their entire lives. Yeah. And what they did and posted when they were 13 is going to be there when they're 63. Yep. And we don't have a legal infrastructure that, that can deal with that in any meaningful way. Yeah, we, we don't, and it's a, it's a hairy area. It's a hairy area in employment law. It's a hairy area, you know, for, like, dating, right? Like, mm -hmm. just, you know, look at someone's Facebook profile. When they're, um, I think that culture will adapt to that, to people's online presence being public. But I think it'll be, you know, theatrical almost. It's like your public presence is, is, is not the real you. Mm -hmm was that Jim Carrey movie. We all, we all put on a mask, metaphorically mm -hmm. speaking, right? So I think your online presence will be more like this gallery or this like art piece that describes you and then there's the real you. Um, but there's still like you, you know, doing a body shot or something. Mm -hmm. like, like you, and that you don't want to be ever public. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a real question whether people who are young enough have the like ability to decide whether it's smart to do the, put that online or not. Mm -hmm. um, so it's yeah, scary for sure. Speaking of putting stupid things online, <laughs> yes. uh, let's talk about the Trump administration. Okay. Um, I, I have heard on and multiple fronts, you're obviously working with a lot of public data sets. Yep. Um, you have to go and ask permission to get this information a lot of times or figure out how, huh. to, how to ingest it. Um, has there, is it easier now? How, how has the access to public data sets changed since the Trump administration set, took office? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, my, my first caveat when I uh, kind of talk about this stuff is big difference in between, like, the Trump administration and the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. The U.S. government is by far one of the more transparent institutions I have ever come across in the world. Like, we are wildly transparent relative to our peers for the amount of data that we put out, for how much we fund this, this sort of stuff. So, you know, caveat number one. Um, uh, when it comes to Trump, I mean... It's been very clear to me that everyone should be very anxious about this administration's stance with transparency and sharing of information. Right? First of all, there's you know very explicit stuff like taking down the list of uh, visitors to the White House, which was a pr practice that Obama put in place, and I think one of the like most central like accounting systems of. Uh, of, uh, of the government. There's been, you know, EPA data, there's been climate data, um, and, and generally there's been uh, uh, even debate about some census data being affected by this. You've got to remember, these are no small endeavors. I think the U.S. Census is over a $4 billion investment every time it happens, mm -hmm. with something over like 300,000 volunteers involved. And so some of these things will see their impact in four years. Right, just given the funding cycles of, of how it happens. I think this administration is certainly not friendly, but I think that the transparency backbone in this country is strong enough. And oddly, you know, that comes from both the left and the right. Mm -hmm. uh, strong enough to make sure uh, that these, uh, that these uh, uh, kind of this movement towards uh, openness of, of information uh, is here to stay. And, and there's a lot riding on these data sets.
Yeah, it's how we, you know, decide where to put hospitals. It's how we decide, you know, how to route, uh, you know, ambulances. It's how we decide, you know, just so many of these base services, like waste management, right, relies on these sort of things. So uh, tell people, uh, looking at the Enigma public data set, which I've visited yeah. multiple times, um, super, super cool. What should people expect when they go there? Um, what can they get out of it? So one of our commitments is to continuously being uh, uh, kind of honest about this mission of uh, collecting all of the data but giving it back as much as we can to folks. It's completely free to use you know, for non-commercial purposes, for journalistic purposes. You know, we we want to make sure that everyone has access to this data. You don't even need to log in or give us any information to go ahead and access it. You know, w when we founded the company, uh, you know, this big premise on on access. Uh, as we've you know learned a lot more through the years, you know, access and interface design and search and creatability have been very important. The other one has been curation, and that's the the uh, huge focus of Enigma Public, which we kind of re relaunched in uh, 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 this summer, was this notion that people need to know how this data is being used. People need to know, uh, you know best, not only best practices for how to work with data, but which data sets are good for what. What's new? What's exciting? Uh, I think that sort of education is something that we're very excited to be part of and, and something that we hope people will get a s the second they land on the site. Yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. And I think, again, businesses see that data and they know that they can build businesses on top of it. Yes. Um, I think for journalists and for citizens who, um, there's a lot more education that's required. Absolutely, a lot more education and, and hopefully a whole layer of services on top of it delivering uh, things to, to, to people, uh, you know, like me and you uh, mm. when we don't geek out, so to speak. Indeed, although we are always geeking out. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, let me ask you the questions I ask everybody that comes on the show. Sure. Uh, what technological trend concerns you the most? Is there anything that keeps you up at night? Um, so the trend that concerns me the most or the thing that I think on the horizon that we should watch out for the most is definitely uh, this notion of, of uh, kind of biological programming. So the extent to which we are getting much better at you know, programmatically creating strands of um, biological you know, living organisms. And you know, that has huge impact for good, but also has huge impact for you know, the ability to create small scale, uh, uh, um, uh, basically malfeasance through these things. So I'm, at wherever technology and bio meets, uh, I'm always a bit kind of concerned as to how that's handled. It's like the, the next wave for me post-nuclear is, mm -hmm. is really our ability to, uh, to do things like programmatically sequence stuff at, in a small-scale lab and, and, and distribute it. Yeah. And the challenge is that even if we pass laws here in the United States, that doesn't mean that someone can't do the same research in China or in the U.S. in, the, in, in Russia. Absolutely. And even from a safety perspective, right? So we really start to have the means now for anyone to kind of DIY their own uh, biological like warfare program, right? So that that for me is the the thing that concerns me the most, and that I would be uh, on a trend for. But the flip side is things like personalized medicine, mm -hmm. the fact that you can really understand my body, you can almost create like this biological version of a software program designed to cure whatever illness I have, and. You know, just as concerned as I am, I'm also excited for that. Yeah, I think the the shortcoming there will be we need some kind of ethical structure yep. to put these new technologies in. Uh, we did it with nuclear weapons and nuclear power, um, barely, uh, but we did it there, and I think we're going to need to develop something similar. Um, on a personal level, is there a technology that you use every day that's just transformed your life that uh, you're amazed by? Um, yeah, I, this is kind of weird, but just FaceTime. Right, just like or video chat. I am, you know, I my family. Uh, I have some family members abroad, and uh, I travel a lot for work. I, it just, you know, the the difference in between a phone call and like a video chat, just kind of casually on the phone. It's really made me feel, you know, the kind of whole promise that the internet has connected everyone. You know, being able in a matter of fifteen seconds seeing someone, I'm originally from Morocco, so seeing someone across the globe and, and saying, hey, what are you up to? And seeing what, it look, what kind of the weather looks like in their environment and seeing how they're dressed and, and their demeanor. For that 
has really changed how I feel connected to, to folks around me and, and made me feel like we all live part of in this you know big village a bit more and I like that feeling. There's something interesting too that you know I, I watched the video conferencing boom sort of rise it was gonna be the next thing nobody would be making phone calls yeah. anymore video conferencing never really took off but video chat yes more personal profoundly different and not in a work environment yeah in a, so, something almost more casual than yeah. a telephone call yes like it, it could be an instantaneous thing yes and um and it really does and the fact that it works globally is pretty amazing yeah and i'm obsessed with so i have a three-year-old daughter and she totally has the hang of it right she video chats before she phone calls yeah. She doesn't know what a phone call is. You put a speakerphone, and you ask her to chat to someone, and she's not at all interested. You put her in front of her grandfather on, on uh, FaceTime, and you know, she could be there for 20 minutes. Yeah, it's it, going to be as strange to her as those rotary phones yes. that uh, kids today don't know how to use. Yeah. Because like, why would you dial it around? Why wouldn't you just have a button? Yeah, exactly. And um, she'll feel the same way. Yeah. Isham, how can people follow you online, find out what you're doing, keep up with Enigma? Uh, go to enigma.com. Uh, check out Enigma Public for sure. It's public.enigma.com. Uh, check out our website. We have a pretty active uh, Twitter account. No Instagram for, for us yet. Never uh, say never. Never say never. But um, do great things with infographics. Yeah, that's true. We were really huge fans of, 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 of data viz. We do have um, this cool part of our site, uh, labs. Enigma.com, where you know it's called all of our experiments and some of our pro bono projects, like the one I mentioned with New Orleans. So, I check I check that out as well. Very cool. Thanks so much for coming on. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. That is fast forward for today. I want to thank you for joining us. If you want to see past episodes of this show, you can find them on PCMag.com. You can also find them on Apple Podcasts, on Google Play, and on YouTube. Anywhere else that find podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'll see you in the future. Mm -hmm.